Let's spend a little time talking about beamformers. What does it do? We know from previous discussion that beamformers involved in the transmission of the ultrasound pulse by providing electronic pulse delay to the high voltage pulser. It also is involved significantly in the receiving end. First of all, it controls the dynamic receive focusing. Now in older systems, analog delays are applied to each incoming transducer element signal and then added to create an aggregate output. In newer systems, however, the signals from each element is first digitized and then receives a digital delay. The advantage of having a digital uh, beamformer is that it's more amenable to programmable transducer probes that's used in today's systems. Here again is the block diagram of the ultrasound scanner. During receive mode, you start off at the transducer end, which receives the echoes from the various reflectors, as denoted by the red. It fans out to all the transducer elements, which in turn feeds in through the transmit receive switch. In this case, the receive switch is turned on. The aggregate signal that we talked about earlier is then fed in to the low noise amplifier. which we will talk about in a little more detail under pre-amplification. The ultrasound echoes the return from the transducer is amplified with a low noise amplifier, otherwise known as LNA. Now the deficient of gain through the LNA is the ratio of the output signal to the input signal in the units of decibels, dB. The input signal amplitude oftentimes is very small range from microvolts to millivolts. Therefore, by amplifying the, from the microvolts to the millivolt levels is important, aside from getting the uh, desired amplitude, that you limit the noise and distortion because all of those things get amplified as well in later stages. So let's do it right from the start. Preamplification, definition of gain is 20 log of A out over A in in decibels. We can do an example to illustrate its usage. What is the gain of an LNA for an input amplitude of 10 microvolts of a resulting output voltage of 10 millivolts? We know that microvolts, there are 1,000 microvolts in 1 millivolt. And therefore, the gain would be 10,000 microvolts, which corresponds to 10 millivolts, divided by 10 microvolts. You take a log of that, so you have 20 times 3 decibels. Therefore, the gain for this preamp stage is 60 decibels coming out of the low noise amplifier. Again, during receive mode, you get the amplification of the signal through the LNA, upon which time it enters the next functional block called the variable gain, variable gain amplifier. This variable gain amplifier, as its name implied, can be applied judiciously according to the depth. The then signal is then fed through the low-pass filter, LPF, analog digital converter, and then to the receive beamformer, which applies various delays to get the right in-phase ultrasound signals. Notice that the beamform control can also interact through the time gain compensation to affect changes to the variable gain amplifier. Let's discuss compensation and how it's used. As you know, signals from the surface reflectors are very strong. On the other hand, deeper reflections that occur long after the pulse is transmitted are very weak. So to kind of balance things out, you have two options. First option is to increase the overall gain, which unfortunately affects reflectors across all depths, so you have no uh, balancing. However, you can opt for option two, which is through the use of time gain compensation to adjust for the increased amplitude loss with depth. Therefore, the deeper reflectors will, create, will get more amplification, whereas the shallower reflectors will get less. So specifically, let's talk about time gain compensation. In principle, since the velocity of sound is 154 centimeters per millisecond, if there's 1 dB per centimeter loss, in amplitude, the theoretical time gain needs to be 154 decibels per millisecond. Fortunately, typical ultrasound pulse contains many lower frequency components, which does not require as much compensation as you would think theoretically. 
Now, also, lower velocity tissues such as fat would lessen the compensation requirements as well. In reality, TGC minimizes surface echo strength as well as signal, signal application of deeper structures, such that you get this curve. So in the surface and way deep in the body tissue, you do not really apply much gain. However, in between, you apply a constant slope or a slope of your desire that gives you the appropriate TGC compensation. Note that TGC is under operator control. In terms of uh, the more of specifics of TGC, what is appropriate time gain compensation? First of all, you want more amplification for deeper reflectors versus shallower reflectors. This is a TGC slider bar that you see in some machines. In the vertical scale is the depth. As you go down, you get deeper. And the horizontal scale is gain. As you go to the right, you get more gain. So for a certain uh, soft tissue uh, situation, you want to turn up the, uh, the gain for the deeper structures as shown in this configuration. Now here is a uh, ultrasound image of an appropriately adjusted uh, surface vessel. It is optimal. Now let's show you some non-optimized TGC images. On the left side is optimal. On the right side there is too much gain in the far field. So therefore the gain was turned up too much at higher depths. Now on the other side you have too little gain in the far field. Too little gain. So you need to bump that up. Here in the near field, there's too much gain. So you need to turn that down. Finally, you can have another case where you have too little gain in a near field. So you need to turn up the slider bar at shallower depths. Now a word on receiver gain. In contrast with transmitter gain, overall receiver gain does not increase acoustic exposure. In patients, and therefore that's desirable. So whenever possible, it is preferable to increase the receiver gain as opposed to transmitter gain. Let's do a question. What is the best combination of receiver gain and transmit power to minimize acoustic exposure in patients? So as you can surmise, there are four combinations. Is it A, high receiver gain, high transmit power? Is it B, low receiver gain? low transmit power? Is it C, high receive gain, low transmit power? Or finally, is it D, low receive gain, high transmit power? You may pause the video to gather your thoughts. Correct response is C, high receive gain, low transmit power. This combination optimizes the ultrasound image while minimizing acoustic exposure for the patient. The definition of dynamic range is the ratio of the maximum input signal over the minimum input that can be detected. Surface reflectors typically give up very strong signals. Therefore, they form the upper limit for the input amplitude. On the other hand, deep reflectors give up very weak signals. Sometimes they require amplification up to 1,000 times just to be detected. They are also compromised by noise generated by the transmission cable as well as a low noise amplifier. In terms of system components, the receiver has very high dynamic range up to 89 dBs, whereas the display and recorders typically have very low dynamic range between 20 to 40. When we talk about dynamic range, we're talking about number of shades of gray. Increasing dynamic range gives you more shades of gray. As you can see in this plot of the ultrasound brightness versus the relative echo amplitude, you have a certain slope, in this case 50 dB, which tells you how much you have to change in the input to vary the different uh, ranges of brightness. If you want to increase the dynamic range, you make the slope of the curve uh, less steep. In this case, you have a purple curve with a 70 dB dynamic range. This means that you can uh, accept a wider range of input signal to yield the same range of ultrasound brightness. By shrinking the dynamic range, let's say going from 70 dB from a shallower slope to 50 dB with a steeper slope, you cut out a segment of uh, input signal that can be detected by your system, as shown by the red arrow. Dynamic range, as we talked about earlier, is equivalent to the number of shades of gray. By reducing the dynamic range, it means that we're 
that a smaller change in echo amplitude will affect the same grayscale brightness changes that you see at a previously higher dynamic range. Therefore, image contrast is enhanced for a smaller dynamic range. Let's look at some examples. Of a picture of a surface uh, shallow vessel at a dynamic range of 120 dB, notice the wide range, a huge range of gradation of grayscale. Let's look at another plot of a somewhat lower dynamic range of only 78. Here you see that there's less gradation of gray and a little better contrast. Now if you consider a dynamic range of uh, even lower amplitude, so from 51 dB, you see that compared to 78 dB, you have an even more black and white or higher contrast picture and less gradation in terms of the grayscale. Comparing 120 to 51 dB, it becomes crystal clear that higher dynamic range gives you more shades of gray, but lower dynamic range gives you better contrast.